So my name is Bikini Chanda, and most of you will know that um, <coughs> I've become a disciple of Ajahn Brahm in the last four years or so. <coughs> Actually, more than that, uh, about seven years. Um, but originally I ordained in Burma, so I came from the background of um, the Goenka tradition, actually, with a lot of focus on bodily sensations and um, understanding impermanence through observing the sensations in the body. And I guess the big shift for me occurred when I came in contact with Ajahn's teachings because he really emphasized attitude over the kind of object that you're actually observing. So we can take any object in our meditation and turn it into an opportunity to develop wisdom. But often it's the attitude with which we meet experience that determines whether the path is actually going to work or not. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, because relationship is actually the whole of life. You know, we're in relationship with others from the moment we're conceived, actually. Um, and we can't avoid that. Even when we're alone, we're always there, right? We don't get away from ourselves even though we may like to sometimes, and sometimes we may use meditation as a way to get away from ourselves. Um, but this actually never really works. Um, we need to meet things before we can understand them. So, and developing kindness towards ourselves and friendship towards ourselves allows us to actually understand what's arising and stay with it for much longer. So I thought it was interesting I, I find it interesting in myself that the Buddha always speaks about compassion as something that we should develop for ourselves as to others. And I think in the West we're quite good at developing it towards others, but less so towards ourselves. So then I started thinking about what does it mean to actually be a best friend to ourselves, and how can we kind of internalize those qualities of a best friend and bring them to our practice. So really you know, pervade all of our experience as though we're looking with kindly eyes upon someone we love or someone we respect very much. And I think often in the West we have this concept that perhaps it's selfish to care for ourselves, and especially women perhaps. <laughs> yeah. But I think people in general, um, with our conditioning, expect so much of themselves, especially in terms of giving to others. And we don't take a lot of time to really be available to ourselves. Um, I have a nice little quote here, actually, which I thought kind of summed this up. It says, Loving yourself does not mean being self-absorbed and narcissistic or disregarding others. Rather, it means welcoming yourself as the most honoured guest in your own heart, a guest worthy of respect and a lovable companion. So this is quite beautiful. And... Um, Respect is such an important part of the practice. I read a, a little anecdote from a, a couple who've been married for 70 years, and somebody asked them, what's the secret of that? And they said, basically, giving each other space and admitting when we're wrong. So this also kind of comes into the aspect of forgiveness. Another way to define love is basically an endless act of forgiving ourselves. You know, forgiving ourselves no matter what, and again and again, and there's never too many times to forgive. Um, lowering our expectations of ourselves. So think about how you feel when you're with a best friend, if you have good friends. What is a best friend to you? To me, it starts with kindness. I read something on the internet, and um, someone had written into one of the, uh, John Graham's YouTube videos and said, um, Ajahn Brahm is one of my closest friends, even though we've never met, but he's kinder to me than my own parents. And I thought this was so beautiful, because it's something about that kindness that enables us to feel fully accepted and fully embraced. And I think it's because of Ajahn Brahm's kind of understanding of the human predicament that he can extend this kind of friendship towards everybody, because he sees that we're trying our best, you know, and we are subject to the defilements as long as we're not enlightened, these things are going to be there, and that's to be expected. But when we try to deny them or resist them, push them away, we're basically strengthening them. There's a nice little phrase um, in psychology nowadays. They, they're starting to really internalize the Buddhist teachings to quite a great degree. And um, it says, what we resist persists, which I thought was lovely. So the same thing with thinking, you know, with negative thinking or thoughts that we don't want. 
they found that actually the more you suppress these things, the more it creates a preoccupation with the very things we're trying to eliminate. Mm. So there was this study done with, you probably all know about the pink elephant. They also talked about the white bear or something, and there were two different groups, and they said one group has to intentionally think about a white bear, and the other group has to not think about a white bear, okay, for five minutes. And surprisingly, they found that the group who intentionally thought about the white bear thought about it less often than the group that tried not to think about it. Because <laughs> as soon as we're told not to, we start to battle, you know, we start to have this inner struggle. So, and I think, you know, this translates into our meditation too, so, yeah, other qualities. I have a very good best friend, actually. We've been friends since we were four years old. Um, so it's quite easy for me to kind of get the idea of what that means. Um, and I think part of it is someone who really accepts you for who you are. And not just parts of you, but all of you. you know, acquaintances or friends, ordinary friends, they know some parts of you. Maybe you don't show all your parts to them. You know, There's parts that you still want to hide. But with a best friend, you can really be yourself. And they, they know you. They know you in your struggles. They know you at your best. They don't deny that you have weaknesses, but I found with my friend that she never overemphasizes those weaknesses. In fact, she diminishes them in her own mind and also towards me. So she'll tell me, that's nothing, you know, I'm much worse than that, or, you know. And my strengths, she always holds very highly and praises them. But what do we do to ourselves, you know, in this regard? Does anybody know what self-disparagement is? <laughs> Disparagement, yeah, or deprecation. Deprecation's a good one. Deprecation means um, kind of speaking to yourself in a way that puts yourself down, but also speaking in that way to others. So, for example, someone says, "You'll give a great talk," and I say, "No, no, no, I'm really shy. You know, I always mess up. Um, I won't do very well at all." You know, this is a kind of self-deprecating uh, voice. And it's actually a kind of maladaptive strategy to try to lower other people's expectations of us so that we won't disappoint other people. So it's quite kind of clever in a way, but quite twisted. Mm -hmm. And I think we do this a lot because we're so afraid of letting people down, letting ourselves down. We put ourselves down very in the first place, you know. We put ourselves down so that nobody else can do it for us. Um, and it's actually the opposite of, of recognizing our strengths and our qualities. Yeah. Which kind of flies in the face of what the Buddha was saying. You know, he taught us to, well, first of all, that the human birth is very precious, very rare, <coughs> and that we have the capacities to attain full awakening. Whether in this life or in another life doesn't really matter. There's a lovely um, quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi. He says, there's only two things needed for liberation to start walking on the path and to continue. <laughs> it's just so easy, you know, you just start walking. So the whole path can be looked at in terms of befriending, befriending ourselves, befriending our um, actions, befriending others. You know, that's the ground of sila, not wanting to create harm for others. And uh, I think it's really important to get this attitude right, because on the other side of befriending is also the wish to bypass. I always say befriend and not bypass. Bypassing is wanting to go over, jump over the difficulties, over the suffering before we've actually met the suffering. Um, and I can understand why that might be, you know. We're motivated sometimes, of course, to have more happiness in our life, you know, to come out of suffering. But ironically, it's that very wish to come out of suffering that can sometimes cause us to reject the suffering and try to push it aside or repress it. And like we said, you know, whatever you suppress comes back. <laughs> the thoughts that we try to push away come back and haunt us, you know. They don't leave us alone. <laughs> so, yeah. Other qualities of a best friend. What are they? Forgiveness. We've talked about forgiveness. Anybody else? Looking after them. Looking after them, yeah. Looking after them. Boy, so what does that mean, looking after... When something happens, you know, to make sure they're all right. So if they right. need something, you're there to help. Right, and I mean, right, really right. help. Right. Yeah, just not a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
somebody else say? Trust. Trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is really important. Yeah. Trusting a friend. Can we trust ourselves as a friend? Mm -hmm. Can we trust our own judgments or our own motivations? <laughs> if we can trust our motivation and intention, Could I fight think. Sweet sometimes. <laughs> Sorry? Could have fight with sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> But trusting our intentions, I think once we get the intention right, yeah. you know, the rest kind of follows. And my teachers in Perth, especially Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali, they spend a lot of time talking about the foundations, getting mm -hmm. those right. So establishing the right relationship with ourselves and the right intention. Mm -hmm. It's the second factor of the noble path. And it has to colour everything, all the factors that come afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, we may make mistakes, but the, the point is we're trying, right? We're trying to relate to experience in a way that's relieving our own and others' suffering. So I think we can be forgiven for that. Yeah. So remembering our intentions, I think, develops trust. Yeah. Yeah, so how would life change if we were to relate ourse to ourselves the way we relate to a friend? You know, just think about that. <laughs> you know, some of the thoughts we have towards ourselves, the inner voice, the critic, or the inner tyrant, We'd never dare to show those thoughts to anyone else, right? Or we'd never dare to talk to somebody else the way we talk to ourselves. It's, uh, yeah, sometimes a little bit too harsh. And um, again, there have been lots of studies in psychology to show that criticism doesn't actually work. It tends to generate a sense of being attacked. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have these parts of the brain that respond to perceived threats, such as, um, you know, it's called the fight-flight response. So if we're being attacked, in the past, you know, maybe by bow and arrow or whatever, mm. <laughs> we're programmed to run. Or, but nowadays, what happens is the same program's there, but the attack is often from internal, an internal threat. So we perceive our own emotions as a threat, and we attack those, which is very ironic because you're actually in this kind of cycle where you're attacking the the attacker, <laughs> and the attacker's attacking you. So it's a negative feedback loop. Yeah. So, probably should move on towards how to apply this in our practice. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is becoming friends with our own emotions and feelings. And the two are so intricately connected, it's a really fascinating area. You know, you can, if once you start to develop awareness of the body, which means being available to the body, being friendly with the body, wanting to stay with the body, <laughs> you know, just as you'd want to stay with a friend, then you can start to see how the mind and the body are interacting. And often, you know, some emotions like anger, they have a root in the body. Sometimes it's the cause, sometimes you just feel edgy, you know, you have an unpleasant sensation and you feel in a bad mood, you're not quite sure why. But sometimes when you look at the body, you find, oh, yeah, it's actually this sensation that I'm not making peace with, that's kind of, I'm wrangling with. And this, it works the other way around too, you know, you can feel the sensation in the body and then develop, well, develop anger, but also once the anger's there, the sensation in the body becomes more intense and then you start reacting to this if you're unconscious of it. So we have the feelings and the sensations which are connected to the emotions, but then we often add on a lot to that. So we add on our impression, that's just like the perceiving or the evaluating part of the mind. This is bad, I don't want this. Or it's boring, it's just boring. Yeah. Or even this is unbearable, the pain is, you know, I can't survive this pain. So this is the impression that arises in the mind, which, of course, you can see is twice as much suffering as just the mere sensation. Mm. <laughs> and then on top of that, it leads to a response or a reaction, which the Buddha called sankara. And that means something that's built on top, something that's fabricated. So you this is kind of like putting in the building blocks of suffering. First you have the physical pain, then you have the impression that I don't want this, and then the response, clinging or pushing away, denying. So you're building it up. And sometimes it's very um, effective to just come back to the bare sensation and stay with that. But the way you stay with that has to be as a friend. So we don't push out our friends, right, when they come home to us, <laughs> when guests come to visit. <laughs> we don't say, get out of here, you don't belong, you know, you look really smelly today, or I don't, I don't like what you're wearing, you know. 
on the contrary, they're just guests, and we tend to treat guests really, really well. So I think if we can understand that these sensations and emotions are also just passing through, it can help us to treat them more kindly. Maybe we offer them the best of what we have. Look at all these flowers. You know, we offer flowers because <laughs> it's a special occasion. So this helps us to actually stay with the experience. And you can only understand things when you are actually aware of them. You can't get to the step of letting go without first meeting something. And also yes. How does fear come into it? Fear. Fear. Well, probably. fear is a. Uh, the Buddha describes fear as an aversive. It's it's related to aversion. It's mm. related to not wanting something. But I think also it's to do with this process of building on the bare experience, like interpreting it in a way that makes us feel perhaps like oh, there's something wrong with this experience, this shouldn't be happening, you know? And so we tried to push it away. And, I mean, I went through some fear at one point. It was a result of um, something that had happened to me. Like, yeah, somebody got quite violent with me, and um, a couple of things <coughs> happened in my life to trigger it again. And at the time, um, luckily, I was reading a book on trauma. And, you know, when it would be triggered, I'd just feel this kind of trembling all through the body. And I noticed that it was very hard not to be afraid of the trembling because the whole energy of it was fear. <laughs> How can you not be afraid of that? But once it sort of persisted and it persisted, and I read this book and, which talked about um, this being actually a way of discharging the shock. Mm. And I thought, okay, so it's happening, it's good for me. It's actually good for me, so I can just be with this. Okay, I can't sleep, but I can just stay with this all night. And I had to, you know, I had to say, okay, never mind if I don't sleep, I'll just stay with this. And it felt like it was just processing, it was just going through me. And by the morning it had passed, and I felt so alive. I mm. felt so alive again, it was really extraordinary. As if something had been suppressed and I'd kind of numbed out, really, to those feelings and put them aside. But then actually when it came out, it was good for me. Mm. So I think fear is often a bit of um, a red herring, could mm. you say? Um, it's more of a conditioned response. And all of these things are conditioned by our past, you know, by the things we've heard as children, the way people have related to us, the things we've believed about ourselves. But they're just part of the human experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's common in meditation, too, to feel fear. And often, when we're about to go more deeply in the practice, you know, we're, we're going into unknown territory or we're having to lose what we know of as kind of our area of control. So at this point, often fear comes up. But Ajahn Brahm always says it's a good sign. Yeah, because you're losing your attachments. <laughs> yeah. So I thought we could do some meditation um, because I don't really want to just talk about the theory. And we could practice working with sensations and emotions in different ways. So. As I mentioned, the attitude is the first thing that's very important, so an attitude of compassion. This means whatever we experience, we add goodwill into the experience. Right? So first the contact, first the experience, allowing that, and then actively generating goodwill. Sometimes this is difficult, and we might not quite get how that works, but at least just remaining open to whatever's there. Sometimes you can slip in a phrase, may I be well, or may I learn to care for this pain or this emotion. And then there are different ways of approaching it as well, and this is quite important. I didn't really learn this for years because with the um, Goenka, the way Goenka teaches is more about understanding the impermanence. But I also think it's important to know that you can have different degrees of distance from the experience. So, for example, one approach is to go right into the sensation. Okay, there's some pain there. If the mind's strong, this is sometimes a good approach. If the mind feels resourced, you can actually directly contact that area and penetrate it. It's very interesting. You can sometimes feel different threads in that experience. You know, maybe there's, I don't know, intense pain or a sensation of anxiety, and you can go right into it and see in detail what's happening. It's not actually a fixed, solid experience. There is change there. It is passing through. So this is one way to focus in on something. And then another way is to have a kind of more delicate, generalized um, awareness. 
So this could be the whole body, or it could be that you feel the difficult area and then you expand, you expand, you expand. So it's like spreading butter or something like this. Um, <coughs> and you feel where it ends, you know, you feel the edges of it. Um, so there's a little bit more distance and spaciousness in the mind. So there's another um, definition of mindfulness that's quite nice here. They say that mindfulness is like, um, say you have a bull who's very wild. He's wild because he's um, contained, like he's on a, a, I don't know what you call this, a harness or something. He's um, confined in a small space, so this bull becomes more and more wild. But then you put the bull in a field, in a big open field, and he starts to calm down. So mindfulness can be seen as this big field, you know, it can be like a bigger area, a more spacious emotional field. So that's like taking a step back and just, yeah, not going right into the middle of something. So there's a bit more perspective. And then the other thing is, um, especially with experiences of trauma or uh, emotions or um, physical sensations which are very difficult, um, there's a way to move in and out of the experience. So you're not suppressing it, you're not completely, you know, avoiding it by going somewhere else, but you're not with it the whole time. So maybe just notice it for a while and then, okay, spread the attention again. So <coughs> spread the attention can mean spatially, like going to the palms. The palms of the hands and the feet are really good for this because they tend to be quite neutral sensations. Or it could mean going to the breath as an anchor, if that's your anchor or maybe going to metta practice if you've been doing that if you're familiar with that you could put in a few phrases there okay may i be able to hold this with kindness or just may i be safe may i be well whatever works so this is called tritration in psychological terms it means you take a little bit you know you go in there a little bit and then you back off you back off so that you don't process the whole thing at once you know, sometimes we have these strategies of defense and um, not necessarily suppression, but we don't want to move right into things that are very painful, and they're there for a reason. You know. I didn't used to understand this. I used to think you could go right into it. <laughs> Whatever was a problem, go right for it. You know. But actually, sometimes you need to kind of come in gradually. It's kind of like there's an ocean and you want to go swimming. So some people think, okay, I'm just going to jump right in, just plunge right in. That's okay if you're very confident and you feel safe, you feel, you know, I don't know, energetic. But another way is to go in gradually, like there's a nice stuff, soft slope down to the ocean. So you go in bit by bit. Maybe sometimes you take a few steps, then you take a few <coughs> steps out again. So there's no rush. So again, this, you know, has to be underpinned by kindness and by gentleness. That's the second factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. Okay, so, so <coughs> if you'd like to close your eyes, if anybody wants to stretch first before we sit, we're going to sit for about 40 minutes. If anybody wants to uh, either stretch or stand up if there's not space to stretch and just yeah, have a bit of a break for your knees.